Hello, everyone. We, we have people online, and that's why we, um, we need to get started on this. So thank you all for coming. I will come to your thanks in a moment or two. Um, this is the last Justice Forum for this academic year. This is the last uh, academic year Justice Forum for this academic year because we will have a summer event that I will talk about at the end. Um, and <clears throat> we're very, very, very happy um, to welcome tonight three distinguished people, not only because they are distinguished by themselves, but also because they're doing this fantastically um, interesting project, uh, which they will talk about. Um, and I will start with um, Jackie to my left and go um, circle because I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> um, so, so um, this is the Black Bibliography Project, right? Um, which Jacqueline Colesby and Meredith McGill started three years ago. Actually, 2017. 2017. We've been working on it for a while. <laughs> Wait, who's counting? Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, a lot of work has gone into this project uh, and a lot of COVID. Um, so um, Professor Goldsby uh, is a professor of English, African American Studies and American Studies at Yale University. She currently chairs Yale's uh, Department of African American Studies, although she's on me. Uh, she's actually recently stepped, stepped down. down as chair. She is stepped down. Is she is she liberated. Yes. 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 Um, uh, but she's still the author of the prize winning A Spectacular Secret, Lynching in American Life and Literature, University of Chicago Press in 2006. Um, many articles in African American literature and book history. Um, she's written on um, Jim Crow segregation uh, from 1865 to 1965. In 2015, she edited the Northern Critical Edition of James Weldon Johnson's. 1912 novel, The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. And she's currently at work finishing writing from the lower frequencies, African-American literature and its mid-century moment. Um, sorry? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see the rest is there. Right? The rest is, uh, no, I will, no, we have more to say. Uh, so the research required to launch writing from lower Frequencies led Jackie to design and uh, direct Mapping the Stacks, a guide to Black Chicago's hidden archives. And she managed that project from 2005 to 2010 while teaching at the University of Chicago. We all have our thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Mapping the Stacks helps transform the practice of archival recovery and description in Chicago and across the US as the project became the model for the Council on Library and Information Resources. 27.4 million grant program cataloging hidden collections and archives, which ran from 2008 to 2014. Major work. Meredith McGill was, I cannot lie about this. Meredith McGill has been my friend for a very long time. Um, I've been your friend too. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Meredith is professor of English at, Rutger, at Rutgers University and the 2019-2020 Beinecke Distinguished Fellow in the Humanities at Yale. She is the author of American Literature and the Culture of Reprinting, uh, 1834 to 1853. It was first that came out in 2003 and then- It did, yeah. Yes. Then it was reprinted. And then it was reprinted in, 2000, <laughs> in 2008, um, which is a study of 19th century American resistance to tight control over intellectual property. Not that we don't like intellectual property or control over it. Um, she's the editor of two collections of essays, The Traffic in Poems, 19th Century Poetry and Transatlantic Exchange, uh, 2008. Uh, in which a number of, of uh, scholars model ways of understanding 19th century poetry within a transatlantic framework and taking liberties with the author, as one should, in 2013. A selection of essays from the English Institute that explore the persistence of the author as a shaping force in literary criticism. 
in addition to essays on 19th century poetry and poetics, Meredith has published widely on intellectual property, authorship, and the history of the book. She has written two essays that reflect on the place of bibliography in the contemporary disciplinary division of knowledge, the eco-criticism, repetition, and the order of texts, and literary history, book history, and media studies um, in the collective um, volume by Hester Bloom, Turns of Events. She served as president of C-19, the Society of 19th Century Americanists from 2018 to 2020. And not least, not last, Brand Edwards. He's here, he's with us, he's ours, he's Columbia, is the Peng family, professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia and the director of the Scholars in Residence program at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. His most recent book is the co-written autobiography of composer Henry Threadgill, Threadgill, Is the Slip into Another World, A Life in Music that came out from well, North in 2023. And for 2022-2023, Brent is one of the inaugural Ford Foundation Scholars in Residence at MoMA. So um, I will slip out of here uh, mm -hmm. after I actually thank you all three for coming. Thank To thank again the Department of Latin American and Iberian Cultures, not only for the money that they give us, but also the fact that they make this fabulous space available to us. Um, African American and African Dias Diaspora Studies, uh, the Institute for Competitive, Competitive Literature and Society, and the Center for American Studies. And as always, Eileen Giluli, who made um, Justice Forum possible, who made Justice in Education, in education Initiative possible, and Sylvia, who makes us all exist here. So, um, so Brent will be the, the moderator for this discussion. Uh, after Jackie and, and Meredith present the project. Uh, so I will just move over there and as Brent is doing so that I can see the photographs. Okay, great. Um, so you can keep that slide up for now. <laughs> um, thank you, Nanny and Lindsay and Sylvia. Um, it's really an honor to be here and I'll explain why in just a minute. And I've been thinking, in a certain kind of sense, why bring our project to you? Um, and I think as you hear us describe the project, the ways in which we're going about trying to recover black print material and to bring it into a larger public domain where all of us have access to, it really makes sense for us to be here. And um, you're catching us at a really exciting moment in the project where we're just about to start scaling up and implementing the data model that we've spent uh, from 2017 to 2019 um, designing. So we're really interested in your feedback. And we hope that the ways in which we've described the project to, to you tonight will have you asking us questions about how we're doing what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing, and uh, you know maybe even how you could get involved. Though I don't want to overpromise, <laughs> we're on a Mellon grant too, but it's uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and um, so I'm great. We're grateful to have this space to share the work with you here in the room. This with us this evening, and those of the, those of you uh, in the virtual space. Thank you for making the time. Um, and on this point of justice, it's it's there's a kind of fitting justice to us sharing and introducing this project to you here at Columbia, um, because we stand on great shoulders here with this work. Um, I don't know if you know that Dorothy Porter Wesley was the first African-American to earn uh, degrees in library science here at Columbia in 1931. She earned her bachelor's and in 1932, she earned her master's. Um, and from Columbia, she went on to lead what we now know as the Moreland Spinger um, Rare Book and Manuscript Archives Library at Howard University. And from that post, it's not an exaggeration to say, the Dorothy Porter Wesley transformed how we get access to black print. She redesigned the Dewey Decimal System to create new categories to make black writing visible and accessible and legible. She also wrote the most extraordinary bibliographies, and I wanna say write 
bibliographies, not just compile them. Um, and we know that we stand on her shoulders with the work that we do. And so it's uh, as we kind of launch into the implementation phase of the project, it's really fitting that we're here at Columbia introducing it to you um, in the wake, in, the, in, in, in relationship to and standing on the shoulders of, of the work of Dorothy Porter Wesley. So if you don't know about Dorothy Porter Wesley, go find out. She will just inspire you to want to like just lay down in a library and live there. I mean, she's just amazing. amazing. Radical librarian. Totally. Best radical. kind. Yeah, the best kind. So speaking of introductions, next slide. Uh, we want to give a shout out to our next, um, okay. our newest staff members, Amanda Awanjo, who is our project manager, Mara Kalin, who is our cataloger and metadata librarian, and Teja Ibram, who will be coordinating um, the Rutgers team from her position. And we're proud to say that um, this grant from the Mellon is supporting um, her hire as the Black Studies librarian at Rutgers University. Um, so they're going to be working with us, building out the data model, working with the graduate students who will be describing the objects and the books that we're going to be talking about with you today. Um, and we just wanted to name them and to welcome them in this kind of public way um, to the project. So a last point um, in terms of introductions, Meredith and I will swap the mic um, as we move through our presentation. And so your turn. Take it away. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is just a brief outline of what we'll be talking about uh, this evening. And I'll begin with the first question, what is descriptive bibliography? Uh, we're delighted this evening to introduce you to the Black Bibliography Project, which aims to create authoritative web-based bibliographies of the work of Black authors. Because our project rests on two relatively esoteric disciplines, descriptive bibliography on the one hand and linked data on the other, We'll take some time to define and illustrate these fields for you. Then we'll move on to discuss the kind of interpretive work we hope our project will make possible. As librarians well know, but scholars and students typically don't, bibliographic approaches aren't one and the same. For the Black Bibliography Project, distinguishing between enumerative and descriptive bibliography is important. So let me summarize that difference briefly. And so the next slide will do that. Enumerative bibliography is the most common kind of reference list, uh, one that details basic facts about a work, the creator, title, publisher, publication date, and place of publication. If you put a bibliography at the end of an essay, that's what you're doing, uh, right? And, and, and you might be checking bibliographic lists of works that will have uh, author, publisher, date of publication, place of publication. Uh, descriptive bibliography, on the other hand, includes this information and much more. It focuses on a work's physical embodiment. It details the type of paper, the nature and the number of page gatherings, watermarks, typography, illustrations, print formats, bindings, covers, and so forth, allowing readers to comprehend the material history of a text production. Importantly, descriptive bibliography uh, relies on examining multiple copies of a work. Uh, descriptive bibliographers seek to document changes in a work's material formats over time. When it comes to bibliography of either sort, enumerative or descriptive, students of African-American literature face an old dilemma. While inclusion in the canon of major works of descriptive bibliography is long overdue for Black authors, mere inclusion under current norms of practice turns out to be wildly insufficient for Black print materials, which challenge the ordinary business of bibliographic description at every turn. Uh, next slide, please. Take, for example, the nine volume Bibliography of American Literature, which is known to scholars as the BAL. This work provides comprehensive bibliographic information for American authors of belletristic works who died before 1930. That's its scope. Uh, remarkably, the BAL includes detailed records on more than 20,000 individual volumes. However, due to what now seems like a very narrow definition of literariness, an emphasis on elite print sources, as well as ignorance of a wide range of African-American writing, only a single African-American author earned entry into its ranks. Can you guess which one? Next slide, has to die before uh, 1930, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Uh, so I've given you a picture of, uh, and I'll, we'll show you some close-ups of the entries, just so you have a sense of what, what descriptive bibliography is like. 
A closer look at the BAL entry for Paul Lawrence Dunbar suggests why descriptive bibliography can be such a valuable tool for literary scholars. After extensive research in numerous archives, collating multiple editions of Dunbar's books, and double-checking publication information against copyright deposits, advertisements, and personal correspondence, the editors of the BAL established an authoritative account of the publication history of Dunbar's works. So next slide, this should just pop up a little box, yeah. So for Lyrics of Lowly, Lowly Life, which was published in 1896, the BAL supplies basic publication information, pagination, information about the size, watermark, and quality of the paper, and the next pop-up. Uh, this close-up displays the formula for signature collation, which describes how the, the pages that, that come off the print bed were folded uh, and assembled, uh, details about binding and end papers, corroborating publication information from Publishers Weekly, um, and a list of copies that were consulted. Without a doubt, Dunbar's BAL entry supplies invaluable information for scholars, as well as for collectors and catalogers. And ca collectors use these things all the time. They're like, should I buy this? Which edition is it? Let me check. Uh, so they'll look up uh, what edition it is in the BAL and figure out what they have in their hands. As remarkable as it might be to have a BAL for Black authored texts, Descriptive bibliographies of white authors reflect assumptions that chafe against the realities of what it took for Black authors to get into print. Moreover, they don't reflect the values that african Americanist scholarly and curatorial communities have long brought to the practice of preserving Black texts. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the principles that are guiding us. First, most bibliographic reference works are author-centered. They subordinate other actors, if they're named at all, to the story of the individual creator. In this regard, standard bibli bibliographies obscure what scholar John Ernest called in one of our early planning workshops, the accomplished communities that enabled black writers to reach an audience. Second, most descriptive bibliographies privilege works published in book formats, whereas vital stores of black literature, essays, poetry, short stories, drama, and serialized novels reach readers in newspapers, periodicals, pamphlets, and anthologies. Finally, traditional bibliography winnows and straightens out the often convoluted pathways of a text circulation. It tells the story of publication as an enumerated list of firsts, reinforcing hierarchies of value keyed to rarity, originality, and scarcity. But Black print culture operates along different axes. It plots different coordinates. Black print culture is characterized by overlapping histories of reprints and reissues, excerpts, lags, and revivals. Next slide. Black print frequently uh, circulates outside of and below the radar of mainstream publishing houses and trade journals. Think, for example, of the subscription booksellers of the late 19th century, or the little magazines of the Harlem Renaissance, the glossy coffee table periodicals of the 1940s Black Chicago Renaissance, and the independent publishers during the Black arts era and the rise of Black feminism. Next slide, please. While Black print culture intersects with that of white authors and publishers, it has its own tempo, it has its own pressures to negotiate, and it requires a different set of institutional structures and alliances to thrive and survive. What bibliographic model could trace and distill this flux while also reflecting Black print culture's particular modes of literary production? That's our overarching question, so next slide. Moving from enumerative lists uh, uh, to descriptive links, devising bibliographic methods that draw on the capacities of the digital rather than print media is one way to build such a model. And this is the approach we're taking with the Black Bibliography Project. Unlike codex bibliographies, a digital bibliographic database can be queryable, expandable, revisable, and reorganizable, which is it's no longer ordered only by the lives of authors. Dunbar is under the volume for D and you find all of his works under D. But what about all the people he collaborated with to get that work into print? A digital database allows you to search by different, um, in different ways. A digital bi bibliography can also be powered by crowdsourced information. And here we have in mind the Colored Conventions Project as a vital example of engaging students and lay publics as colleagues and scholar laborers. Since 2017, we've been collaborating with catalogers and metadata librarians at Yale's Beinecke Library, We've worked in partnership with scholars, curators, and librarians across the country, and along with grad students from our home institutions at Yale and Rutgers to develop a bibliographic database that we hope will be better suited to Black print. 
The BBP's approach to descriptive bibliography activates the capacities of linked data, which we'll explain in a minute, to shift the locus of bibliographic value from books as objects, rare objects that rich people own, to the networks of human and institutional actors who create and sustain literary culture. That's the big value move uh, we're trying to enact. It's you. Okay, so what is linked data? So I hope that there's some tech folks in the room uh, <laughs> to follow along. You're probably better at these things than I am. Um, so uh, next slide, please. What is linked data? As Meredith explained, using digital technologies to build the BBP's database will make the information we research and compile queryable, that is, you can ask questions about the data to track out how all these books and pamphlets and magazines paint a picture of Black literary activity at any given point in time. And that information can be reorganizable in ways that print media literally can't afford. But even more important, by using linked data to record the information we glean from Black print sources, the BBP's digital database can activate radically inclusive questions that can transform how we study African-American literature and its histories. Why would that be the case? Which is to ask what makes linked data such a generative tool? Linked data describes a technique for recording meaningful relationships between data points expressed as triples or sets of three terms. Triples consist of three components, a subject, a predicate, and an object. So if you're thinking back to your grammar days, here we go, <laughs> right? Subject, predicates, and objects. The subject names what the triple is about, the predicate names the relationship of the subject to its object, and the object names an attribute of the subject or identifies the subject of another triple to which it's related. Now here's what's key about linked data. Unlike conventional electronic catalogs that silo data into separate categories and portals, linked data schemes record a meaningful or what tech folks call a semantic link between data points. And, and this is the other piece that's important, relationships encoded by the triples, the subject, predicate, object statements themselves become machine readable. Next slide, please. Members of the Beinecke Library's metadata team, who were instrumental in designing the BBP's data model, explain the logic of linked data this way, and I'll read this quote aloud to you. Linked data at its heart is about building relationships among data, relationships that a computer can learn from and interpret, allowing for richer interaction with and interpretation of data, both within a single database, such as the BBP, and across the very data that make up the internet. Next slide, please. So for instance, to render basic information about Frederick Douglass's most famous book in linked data form, one would need to create a very basic set of statements to teach the computer such as, and this is all broken down here in, 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 on the slide here. Frederick Douglass is an instance of a human. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass is an instance of a work. Frederick Douglass is the author of narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. The Boston Anti-Slavery Society is an instance of a collective agent. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass was published by the Boston Anti-Slavery Society. Now for every copy of Douglass's 1845 narrative that a descriptive bibliographer would seek out, remember that examining multiple copies of a work is a hallmark of descriptive bibliography. These same data statements would be entered into the computer. Every time you see a copy, you would enter in the same information, right? So staying with the genre of the slave narratives, as you see here at the bottom, William Wells Brown's 1847 narrative, its descriptive attributes would be entered into the computer too, using the same structured statements as the Douglas 1845 narrative. Next slide, please. As triple statements build up in the BBP's database, computers can read and draw connections between and among those statements pointing toward discovery paths a single researcher might not be able to discern on their own. Now, as this slide suggests, you can see how linked data statements accrue to widen our typical author-centric focus on text and encompass the community of human actors, institutions, and locales that ground, so to say, the making of a Black print text. Again, we get away from, we, we keep Black agency and authorship at our center, but Linked data allows us to name and to see all the other people, all the other institutions, all the other technologies even, 
that Black authors were engaged with to make their work. Okay. Where was I? So using linked data to energize the BBP's database can bring many other exciting questions into view too, besides these social networks, which are important, right? Um, but for instance, we'll be able to ask questions like, this is where the querying comes in, we use that term. Which 19th century black author books were published in paper covers and which in cloth bindings? Which tells you something about the materials that are being summoned to make a black work, right? Which slave narratives had copyrights taken out in the names of their authors and which in the names of publishers or institutions? Which is to ask how much control did black authors have over their work, right? Were mid 20th century black novels more likely to be published in New York, Chicago, or Atlanta? You know, is New York really the center of everything or are other places, <laughs> it is, but are, there other, but are there other places too, right? How much did black books cost and did prices change over time? If we record information about binding styles, copyright statements, genre, prices, and places of publication in linked data form, the relationships between and among these data points become searchable. Converting the physical features of a print object into linked data semantic terms then, the BBP's database promises to reconfigure how we conceive and understand Black authorship's relation to the ever-changing means of literary production. Great. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> We're moving on to how the BBP's data model works. Uh, and this is for books and pamphlets. To develop the BBP's data model, it took a small village. In fact, on this slide, the next one, uh, are the team members, oh, there should be one more slide. Great. Uh, these are the names of the team members who designed and tested the prototype we'll be using to build the actual database. We use Wikibase software to collect, store, and query the linked data statements we derive from close inspection of the books themselves. Next slide. This is what the homepage of our Wiki site looks like. Uh, we devised our data model by testing it against different print formats. Then we refined it along with our data entry workflows by describing as many books and pamphlets as we could find of the 108 items listed in William Andrews' annotated bibliography of African-American autobiography from To Tell a Free Story. So the next slide will remind you that at the back of this wonderful book is a wonderful enumerative bibliography that lists all the books and we're trying to transform it into a descriptive bibliography. We focused on translating Andrews' list into linked data because of its size, 108 seemed doable, uh, and we managed to complete entries for 80% of the works on this list before the pandemic hit. Uh, we, we got shut out of uh, rare book rooms, sadly, but we're confident that our data model will scale up as we build the database. Our data model treats each text at three levels. If I could have the next slide. Oh, yeah, that's good. So the three levels we work on. So every, every text, get, every book or pamphlet gets described three times. Once as a work, then as an edition, and then as a copy. For comparison's sake, this slide, the next one, uh, illustrates how the different kinds of information about Douglas's narrative that appear in a conventional card catalog entry, I call it card catalog, it's a digital card catalog. Uh, that's the Yale entry uh, for Douglas's narrative. Uh, and I'm gonna show you uh, in a second how all this information gets rearranged in the Black Bibliography Project's three-part data structure. So next slide, please. Great. We begin data entry at the level we call the work. So if you could click on that, it will highlight the work. You click the, yeah, perfect. Um, so at this stage, we enter fundamental and unsurprising attributes of a text. The author, the literary genre or genres, if it's more than one. Uh, it's a great thing about uh, digital databases. You can keep adding information. There's not a page limit. Um, and the language the text is written in. However, in the BBP's data model, the work is not a concrete object. This is a really important idea. It's not a thing you hold in your hand. Rather, for our purposes, the work is an abstraction. It's an overarching category that allows other data statements to be connected to it and to one another. This conception of the work as a descriptive category is implicit in bibliographic practice, but it turns out to hold significant implications for Black print culture studies and for Link's data's ability to leverage relationships between and among different kinds of descriptions. The attributes we assign to the work are likely to stay stable as a particular work appears in multiple editions, in multiple formats and across media. This data category enacts the flexibility that characterizes the varied and often fugitive modalities of black print materials in and across time. 
So Frederick Douglass will always be the author of his 1855 autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, even as this text gets reprinted in new editions and translated into other languages, right? And that, that attribute will stay stable. Uh, Entozake Ento Shange, uh, Shange will always be recorded as the author of For Colored Girls Who've Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough, even as the illustrated pamphlet, which was first published by a feminist press, the Shameless Hussy Press, in uh, 1975. It was then republished as a trade press book in 1977. It debuted on the Broadway stage in 76, was adapted as a film directed by Tyler Perry in 2010, and was revived on Broadway just last year. But Shange is always gonna be the author of that work. Linking particular print editions to the abstract category of the work makes it possible for us to understand their relationships with one another. It also makes it possible for us to include orature and other kinds of non-print media like performance, play performances and films in our database. Oral performances such as sermons and lectures or extemporaneous verses that ultimately find their way into print won't have to wait for the print edition to be entered into the database. Likewise, printed poems that were later performed live or that were transmitted by radio or TV could all be linked to one another at the level of the work. Importantly, the BBP's concept of the work challenges and corrects the, cl the claim of universality as a principle in metadata design. Uh, we encountered this, this issue when at one data entry work, we realized that using Wikibase's contributor attribute for all, in, um, all the names of the persons and institutions who've been responsible, uh, sorry, for all the names of persons associated with the work. Uh, let me start that over again so it can make some sense. Using Wikibase's contributor attribute for all individuals associated with the work gave black writers and white editors and publishers equivalent status. This was a problem. Uh, for instance, Phyllis Wheatley and John Wheatley would both be regarded as contributors to the publication of her poems. In Wikibase's data ontology, that's the way in which concepts within a particular domain of knowledge are organized. Within the, when, for Wikibase, the term contributor is neutral. Uh, but for Black print culture, the term can activate forms of racialized power. After careful discussion, and, and we really thought and talked this through many times, uh, we decided to attach the attribute author and only the author at the level of the work. That way, uh, our data model prioritizes and honors the agency of Black writers. So that was really important to us. So we want to include all the people involved uh, in uh, bringing a work to print or into other media, uh, but we want to only author the author at the level of the work. For the second level of data recording, the next, click on the next click and it will give us to the edition. Great. We use the conventional bibliographic definition of edition, which is as follows. All copies printed from one setting of type without substantial change. Uh, that's a uh, bibliographer's def definition of edition. Many attributes can be recorded at this level from the standard notations of place, year and publisher to a more detailed account of those who produced the book as object, including the printer the stereotyper, illustrators, engravers, and numerous persons who, while not immediately engaged, engaged in the physical production of a book, are noted in text as instrumental to publication. For instance, translators, editors, dedicatees, writers of forewords, introductions, and afterwards. There are a lot of names in these books that don't end up in a normal, an ordinary enumerative list. Uh, we also record a number of material facts about the edition, including the presence of frontispieces, illustrations, and the number of pages, which we record as a catalogers extent statement. The, this degree of thick description is not commonplace in conventional catalog entries, nor in enumerative or even in traditional descriptive bibliography. Recording these data points from the print objects themselves allows us to see and to trace these social networks that sustain Black literary production in and across time. Finally, at the copy level, the next one, we record information that distinguishes the particular object we're holding in hand. Here we enter descriptions of the binding, the height and width of the book, its condition, and the library or collection to which it belongs. We also record the names of persons and institutions who've been responsible for preserving the book. This is really important to us. It's called provenance information, right? Uh, how, the, how the book has come down to you, through the people whose hands it, through which it's passed. Provenance information is crucial, including institutional marks, such as book plates and shelf marks, formal inscriptions. We identify association copies, books given by the author to someone else, uh, but also the names of former owners that are autographed on fly leaves. Uh, the next slide. 
The history of black authored books and the ways in which they've been classified by institutions and circulated among families, friends, lovers, colleagues, and other associates are a vital part of their histories. While we've been drawing on Wikidata and the Library of Congress's name authority files to corroborate the individuals and institutions named in the books we study, only about 75% of these names can be found in these authoritative resources. So as we build out the BBP database, we plan to devise a protocol for adding biographical information that incorporates the histories of those who have published, circulated, and preserved Black books into the knowledge portals of these global repositories. So we're trying to push up uh, the names of people who cared for and about Black books uh, into uh, these, uh, like the Library of Congress, the major authoritative source. Back to you, Jackie. Thanks. Next slide, please. So how does our data model work for serials? That's to say magazines and newspapers. Designing a data model for serials and figuring out how individual literary works such as short stories, tales, poems, plays, and serialized fiction could link up with our data model for books was a crucial challenge, one made urgent by the centrality of periodicals to Black literary culture. As Meredith noted earlier, descriptive bibliography ordinarily trains its attention on books. Next slide, please. However, newspapers and magazines are central to the history of Black writing since they provided authors valuable platforms to hone their craft and reach predominantly Black readerships when white-owned and managed firms refused to publish or heavily censor Black authors' work. We're glad and quite frankly relieved. <laughs> it took a lot, it took a lot to figure out this data model and we're still testing it. Um, but we have devised a model for serials and we'll be testing it soon along with one for dust jackets. Next slide, please. Our data model for serials shifts our category slightly, both to account for the relationship of individual issues to the periodical as a whole, and to permit us to record in detail the contents of any one issue. For serials, we treat the serial itself as the work, with the issue in the position of the edition, as this slide outlines. As with books, the description at the copy level remains tied to the particular print object a researcher holds in hand. Individual poems, essays, and tales that appear in anthologies, another distinctive mode in Black print history. If you could, uh, next slide, please. These will receive much the same treatment as periodicals. This is, um, I still marvel at this. Um, Ebony and Topaz, a collection from um, 1927, the Harlem Renaissance, um, organized by Charles Johnson and put out by the National Urban League. And this image doesn't do justice to how big this book is. <laughs> It's, it's, it's about like this, and it is so sumptuously drawn um, and made. Um, it's, a, it's a real thing of beauty, it really is. Um, but as, as you can see from the, the table of contents, there's just an extraordinary um, outpouring of poetry, short fiction, and sociology, and history. We've got to get that information out, right? Um, and that's the kind of information we'll be bringing into our database. But anthologies are a particular um, mode um, in Black print history as well, not exclusive to Black his print history, but um, a, a consistent practice within it. So we'll be able to uh, include these kinds of works in our database. Including serials and anthologies in the database will permit users to, to trace the life cycle of literary works. Next slide, please. Such as Langston Hughes's poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, which appeared um, first in the Crisis Magazine in June 19, 1921, to its first book publication in The Weary Blues in 1926. Ideally, our database would include every single reprinting in book or periodical format. Next slide, please. After those inaugural venues including recitations of the poems, vinyl recordings, and other multimedia literary resource, sources as this map of links illustrate, illustrate. So we're really trying to get to the life cycle of how black print goes in, how it moves in and across time, how it moves in and out of other media, right? Which can allow us to ask different kinds of questions about the nature of language itself even, right? And how it is that black authors are experimenting with that, and the and and those who make the mediums that carry their work. Yeah, that's the dream. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have to get you know. Uh, this is like a snapshot of what the dream would look like, and it, it'll take some getting there. But uh, but but that's where that's where we're aiming at. Uh, so we're wrapping up here. The next next slide. Um, 
The Black bibliography is called to revive and incorporate descriptive bibliography into African-American literary studies isn't new. And Jackie made a point of saying that before we started. We're responding to, to past practice, a long distinguished and innovative tradition of bibliophilia and bibliography among scholars, librarians, and private collectors who specialize in African-American print culture precedes our project's work. So the next slide. Uh, and click again, you'll get something here. Uh, great. The foundations of the field were laid by late 19th and early 20th century print collector activists such as Daniel A.P. Murray and Arturo Schomburg, who prepared essential checklists and bibliographies of books, pamphlets, and periodicals that we will consult. Uh, next click. We'll get us another one. Yeah, that's uh, uh, Schomburg's. Great. The Union Analytic Union Analytic Catalogs describing the Negro holdings in Chicago's research libraries were produced in the 1930s by a brilliantly coordinated team approach that we aspire to emulate in our work. The Kaiser Index to Black Resources, a compilation of subject organized clippings from 20th century Black periodicals, was organized by librarians at the Schomburg Center starting in the 1940s. Listing magazine and newspaper articles by topic across time, the Kaiser Index ingeniously articulates its own metadata schemes that we intend to study in greater depth. When the biographies of major authors began to be published in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, uh, next click, um, that's an example of the Ann Petrie uh, biography, they are often accompanied by standalone bibliographies that are richly researched and, and that relay invaluable book history detail that we hope to spotlight as we build our database. I, I think grad students often don't know they're there, yeah. the bibliographies at the back, uh, and they're a treasure trove. Yeah. I have to say, because I checked out the Ann Petrie book myself, the last time, at least according to the date stamp, that that book was checked out, and it records every single thing she ever wrote and where it appeared, was checked out in 1996. You know, we are making work harder for ourselves than it needs to be sometimes, and we don't go back to this work, but we're hoping that the database we build will make it easier to bring this information forward. Between new digital humanities initiatives, which often require item-level inventories of materials for designers to curate and organize, increasing scholarship in Black book history and textual studies, which de also depend on tracking multiple editions of a given work, and the critique of the archive which theorizes the cultural elisions and institutional exclusions of black primary sources from preservation practices. Thinking bibliographically, to use scholar Elizabeth McHenry's apt phrase, can support those efforts and pave new directions in the study of African-American and black diaspora literatures. As McHenry explains, bibliographies are quote, powerful instruments of investigation used by practitioners to test and stabilize how literature is seen, defined and used, close quote. Indeed, then how might black bibliography trace the genealogies, physical formats, modes of publication, distribution and circulation of black print cultures in and beyond the US? We're just focusing on the US right now with our project, but beyond, what about beyond? What insights might we learn from the bibliographic practices across the diaspora from black Francophone, Hispanophone and Anglophone Caribbean literatures? from sub-Saharan African literatures, from the literatures of Black Brazil and Black Europe. Like, what is there to know? As these questions suggest, we hope the BBP's approach to descriptive bibliography activates how the term Black suggests multiple histories of print production, circulation, and consumption that await to be explored, not as a seamless homogenous field of inquiry, but instead that we conceive and map them as a constellation of possibility of relation, right? That how these things can come together. So that's what we're up to. Yeah. I think there's one final slide. Oh, it's just, oh. yeah, it's just our- oh, uh, And keep one more. more. Oh, there, there we go. go. <laughs> and we've got some slides sort of hidden in the back <laughs> to answer just, just questions. questions. Yeah. So yeah, we, there may be some more yeah. slides there. Yeah. We'll see. So Brent, Brent will just bring this to the well, this is exciting. And I, I, I think I want to start, I don't have a formal response. I'm going to say some things and ask some more questions and then we'll open it up and can have a discussion. Um, but I, I do want to start by underlining how exciting this is, because I think the risk is that it can seem all too dry <laughs> and academic and behind the scenes perfunctory, putting things in piles. And I just want to emphasize for those of you who are not 
real old yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. in the way some of us who work in the sex and live in the sex perhaps a little bit too often can be um, by these kinds of questions of information management how radical and important this is um, it's about and the work of people like Elizabeth Henry that, that you two just mentioned uh, Laura, Laura Helton's work um, I know is part of the group uh, has the, the work of scholars like this has really taught me to think about the radicality, the political radicality, and the sexiness <laughs> of something as dry and boring as bibliography. Yeah. Um, something that you thought, uh, that can't be cool. <laughs> this is cool, and it is radical. It's about what both McHenry and Helton say is, um, it, what they make clear is that it's about making categories thinkable. It's about bringing things into view that you can't see as issues, can't see as problems, can't see as questions until you can see things in the same place. And it comes out of a history where in this country, not that long ago, it was generally assumed that there was no writing by African-Americans. There might be a Negro problem. There might be a problem <laughs> of what do we do with those former slaves. Uh, but they don't have their own writing. Oh, they're oh, that's that one Dunbar. Yeah. So this work comes out of the work of bibliophiles, of black book collectors, and historians. Some of them lay historians, not academics, not with PhDs necessarily, including people like uh, Arthur Schomburg, who went out determined to prove not just that black people have a history, but that we have thought and documented our own history. And you can only do that by making a pile, by saying, <laughs> actually, Black people have written a lot of books, and let me list them for you. So this, the motivation goes back to that motivation. Um, again, it sounds boring until you start thinking about the politics of it. This is from Laura Helton, uh, has this great article on, on uh, bibliographies called Making Lists. Uh, keeping time about infrastructures of Black thought. And she points out that some of the basic modes of classification, if you've been in the library, you got to know where to look to find the book, right? You know there's a book, where is it? You find yeah. it by the column number. And there are different systems of the ways books are organized. The Library Congress that has letters and the numbers is the more recent one and the more prevalent one. But going back to the first one, which is still, if you go in Butler, some of the books still are just numbers. Yeah, like 325, 894, that's called the Dewey Decimal System. This is known, but just to give you a sense of how political it is, Dewey, Dewey is a person who, who developed this system, and he had certain ideas about where race fits in his system of classif classifying knowledge. So Laura points out that uh, uh, in the Dewey system, the number six, what is it? Or the number 326 is what he categorized slavery, serfdom, and emancipation. Everything that had to do with that was supposed to go under 326 and be in that place in the library. There were some other things that had lots of subcategories, like the number 642 in Dewey's system is serving, table, and entertaining. <laughs> and un under 642, there's a special category of 642.55 that is work that describes the meal plan of harvest. <laughs> we need multiple subcategories to get into the true complexity of this object of study. But Black folk, we just need one number. Um, people like Dorothy Porter, when they were saying earlier, this is a radical librarian, what they meant is she took the system that Dewey devised and she said, we're gonna make space for black work and black history and black life by adding some numbers. Um, whereas Dewey famously put uh, the Negro question was one of his categories under 325.26, which is a sociological category. Dorothy Porter said, that's a problem if I wanna track the history of black poetry. If I wanna think about where do I put on my shelf black novels? Uh, I need more numbers. And so part of what Laura points out in her work on order is that she added numbers to the Dewey Decimal System to make space for Black 
books and Black thought and Black history. Um, that is just a clear example of why it's so important, because if you just go by what Dewey told us to do, Black topics are literally not thinkable. You mm -hmm. can't find the issue because mm -hmm. the books aren't together. The books oh. aren't mm -hmm. uh, uh, collected in a way that you can read them as a category. Um, so it's, I don't know if that's any more convincing, but I'm, <laughs> I just wanted to try to, try to say uh, how exciting this is um, and how radical and political it is. It's not, it's not just a euphemism, it's not a joke. It really is about creating space in a way that, uh, that is politically important and radical. Um, I have a few questions. I just want to get you to talk some more, basically, <laughs> and um, and then we can open it up. I have some kind of technical questions, but I'll ask some broad questions too, and then and then we can see where the discussion goes. Um, first of all, because you've just gotten was it last year? The twenty twenty two was one point seven yes million dollar grant from the Mellon Foundation. So the project's been going on uh, for seven years, but as you were saying, this is an important moment, <laughs> an interesting moment uh, to be presenting it because you're at the inception of this new stage. Mm -hmm. And I was looking on your website. If you look on the website, there are descriptions of the gatherings they've had over the years and the agenda, the way they've tried to make these issues thinkable as they've gathered over time. But I just wanted to ask you to give us a sense of where you are you know, after six years of work, now you got this big grant. Where are you and what are the next challenges? What are you working on right now? What are the next steps? Aside from hiring a little more staff. <laughs> you have a little more yeah, of staff, but we'll where, start, are, where are you? Um, what are we're terrified. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we just, we, we're just uh, bringing some grad students into the project and we'll run some training, some intensive training. Again, there are two esoteric areas that people that are grad fellows need to learn descriptive bibliography, uh, how to feel comfortable around um, a technical description of a book and link data. But we're going to roll out the first of those training uh, sessions this summer. And, and uh, we're figuring out another big question for us is scope. Uh, the good thing about uh, digital bibliography is you don't have to decide the scope in advance. But uh, that, you know, I mean, if you're going to do a print codex bibliography, you've got to figure it out uh, before you start doing the work. Um, but at some point, you can't kick that can down the road forever. So we have to make some decisions about, as we did with the Andrews bibliography, what can we do that's going to be a, that's going to enable us to leverage the power of linked data to show the payoffs for literary studies? Right. And to hold make those decisions, we will be making them jointly with our graduate students. Um, and with the advisory board that we've assembled uh, scholars and librarians and curators um, to think strategically about what bodies of writing exist in which repositories that we can get access to to describe. Um, our plan is to, we have a three-year grant and our goal is to kind of start locally um, working in local institutions like the Beinecke Library, hopefully the Schoenberg. Um, and then, you know, New York City has so many other, again, the, since the principle of descriptive, descriptive bibliography is to, to go after multiple copies, we want to see as many copies of a work as we can, right? Um, so we're thinking about regional libraries this first year. Our hope, though, is to go elsewhere. To get out of you know beyond the trice uh, the the Amtrak corridor, um, maybe as far north as it's still on the corridor. You know the the American Antiquarian Society uh, was an early partner for our thinking and conception of the project. Um, so was Fisk University. So was Emory's JWJ collection. Um, the Chicago Public Library. It'd be important for us, I think, to go to different kinds of repositories that might have different kinds of strengths of materials that we've not anticipated. Um, so I think, you, again, we have a three-year grant. Our goal is to define a set of corpuses or works whose explanatory power within themselves are rich and meaningful, not predictable. Yeah. I don't think we want to kind of reproduce the canon here, but there, we're, we're kind of sure that we're going to find some interesting things that will teach us stuff. Um, but that can also, um, this is where the machine readability of the mm. linked data comes into play because there's what we can see when we look at an object, a print object, 
But then there's what the computer can see or read. And we've entered in all these statements. And they might, and, and those queries, right? Those, those queries that we make of the data might point us to other kinds of corpuses that we didn't think we should be looking at. You know, I can imagine that being the case with like pamphlet yeah, literature yeah. across time. You know, um, not 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 book objects, but pamphlets like paper bound booklets, right? Um, because the ways in which those span across the 18th century to the late 20th, you know, it's it's a meaningful mode of publication yeah. for yeah. undercapitalized uh, communities, and that might lead us to sites that we hadn't even thought of. Yeah. Um, We've been so, thinking too about collecting data under principles that aren't necessarily the author. So um, if you think about what black institutions have nourished yeah. black culture, you know, the church, the AME uh, church has a publication arm. So what might it be to, it could we come up with a descriptive list of corpus that would make sense for recording all the data there? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're, that's the scope question is a big one, uh, and so that's I'm terrified of it, but uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, you know, we do uh, it in pieces. That was one of my questions. I'm yeah. glad I have. Uh, let me let's we'll see if we have time to get to that. Is there anything? Is there a prototype already up? I mean, can people go online and look at first entries? Yeah, it's not available. We're in, we just migrated the data from uh, Yale to Rutgers, and it, it's we're told it arrived. <laughs> but I didn't get a receipt, <laughs> you know, so it's a little scary, but um, uh, so we, we, you know, uh, ideally this will be a linked open data project, which is to say that it will be open. We anticipate at the end of the three-year grant to make it available to scholars. Um, we're hoping to design a, a, a front end that's easier to use than uh, right now you have to understand SQL and run Sparkle queries. And it's, you know, you have to have a pretty sophisticated technolo technological knowledge to query the database. So one of the things we'll build is a, is a front end for search. So um, three years from now, <laughs> um, that's our horizon for making it publicly available. Um, and are you starting in terms of, a, you can't start with the binding key and you have to start with the narrower corpus. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Right, 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 are right, you right. starting with the Harris, I mean, um, Andrews, Andrews uh, the bibliography yeah, at yeah. the end of uh, to tell a free story. I would like to finish that. Yeah. They, they, that was what they showed of the slave narrative, the, what, 100 and 108. Yeah. 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 I Is think that where you're starting? Yeah. To we, finish it. To finish it. We're almost done. <clears throat> because of the pandemic. I would actually be interested in combining that for, for our summer training, this first wave, to um, think about the works that are listed in Gene Yellen's The Pen is Ours. Yeah. Um, because that that focuses on writing by black women yeah. before 1910. And what one of the things that we did discover with the uh, <laughs> Andrews bibliography is that the majority of those titles are authored by men. Yeah. yeah. And so it can be very interesting. It might, you know, we might be able to get for a first test of how the data queries run a more robust and more interesting uh, uh, results because we've got a more diverse um, data set. So that that's yeah. my vote. I've got yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm behind it. I'm behind it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess a, a related question mm. is, and there's a question behind this one, but how deep do you aspire to go? Because just to stick, let's just stick with the most canonical, right. the, the founding, if we're talking about the slave narrative tradition, first Douglas narrative. Let's just take that as an example. If you've looked at, do people know what OCLC is, what WorldCat is? Yes. There's a service you can look at online in the Columbia Library System. You can go in and look in this, uh, through this database, and you can see every library that has copies of a particular hmm. book. So if there's a rare book you're trying to find, and maybe it's not at Columbia, but you want to do interlibrary loan and get it from somewhere else, you can see everywhere in the world that has a copy of a particular mm -hmm. book. But if we're talking about Douglas and you're talking about descriptive bibliography, yeah. are you actually aspiring to go and look at the physical and describe the physical attributes of every copy of a book like that that's actually pretty widely distributed? Are you trying to go that deep? Well, it's because it's interesting that, because that, we, yeah, we yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we're gonna have to, you know, three years. 
Uh, we're gonna have to parse out our time here. pretty carefully, but it is, it's really true that um, because there are no authoritative bibliographies of most black authors, there's an awful lot that we don't know. Uh, and when you start looking at the books, you start discovering all kinds of things. Yeah. So it's it's utterly surprising. Um, so uh, you can't go out and look no, at, every at everyone. No, you every can't. Book. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to pick and choose. But we have we have various ideas of groups that would be doable. Um, the American Antiquarian Society has a list of five hundred and sixty-seven self-published books. Self-published books by Black authors. That seems. Doable. We're not going to get every copy, but you, the fact is, you start looking at more than one, and you realize they're not the same edition. Yeah. They have a different frontispiece. They have different illustrations. That you know, and so you know, I, yeah. obviously, we're going to try to seed yeah. a lot of bibliographic and S E E D, not C E D E, uh, but you know, bi bibliographic work uh, in order to make this happen. But you're right; we have to make choices. Yeah, we will have to make hard choices. But a couple of things about that. One, thinking back to the BAL description of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's work. Um, there were um, codes for the libraries that, uh, where copies of the books had been consulted. There were just three yeah. for yeah. him. And I think on some of part of our, our the way in which we uh, define our scope rather than to narrow it, but to define it, it may, might be to, to, do, to do two things. First of all, within our own work to be clear that we are going to be focusing on a set number of repositories, perhaps mm -hmm. that have the kind of rich range of materials we would want to look at. And that's where we're looking. Yeah. Right. Hopefully, what we're doing, and this is where the color conventions project could be a model for us, um, is that we're building out of a, a not only a database, but a model of data collection and a practice of how to teach descriptive bibliography such that over time, yeah. we could yeah. develop teaching partners who were located in all kinds of other places who can go and over time yeah. continue to add information yeah. about multiples that we couldn't get access to just yeah. because we didn't well, have that, the That's the question behind the question. Yeah. Because yeah. you're on the verge of, it's a really interesting and radically new model of and practice of collaboration. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it's not just your team. And it's not the kind of simplistic Facebook hive mind, <laughs> where should I go next week? Uh, it's not that kind of uh, throwing a question out into the ether. It's the prospect of not just your term is your team is working across mm -hmm. disciplinary mm -hmm. boundaries. Mm -hmm. You have your tech people, mm -hmm. your data people, your librarians, your archivists and your scholars and people working in different categories, but one imagines, especially with a kind of wiki uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, template, one imagines a model that you could down the road have one really interesting copy in this yeah. particular yeah. library yeah. in yeah. Atlanta yeah. and that somebody in Atlanta yeah. 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 who's not on your team, That's right. Right. who's not a staff member, who's right. not maybe maybe okay. not someone you know or you, right. you have asked for help, but somebody can step in yes. and mm -hmm. yes. provide that other information. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'm extrapolating, yeah. 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 I assume yeah. that yeah. I can see what, me about the vision of collaboration. What, one of the ways that could work is you've got the work, you'd have the work entered and you'd have an addition. And then you'd say, is that, would you, would somebody go look at the Emory Library copy and yeah compare it to the data that we have. Mm -hmm. Is it the same edition or is it a different edition? If it looks different, maybe we ought to get, maybe you ought to describe it or we ought to get somebody down there to describe it, right? Mm -hmm. Once you've got the work and the edition up there, the primary information, um, you can find the ones that deviate. And that's that's interesting. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of deviation in these yeah, books because you, they got interrupted, they ran out of money, they had to reset the type, the, you know, there are lots of reasons that books um, come out in varying forms. Um, and you only can discover that if you have a, a model of what you think it looks like um, to judge your copy against. And then you can correct it and fill it yeah, in. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, how long? Where, I don't even know what time it is. Oh, I'm looking at Nanny. Uh, oh, okay. Half hour. Okay. okay. I'll keep going a little more and then we'll open it up. And uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll let other people jump in. Um, one, I'm, and I'm sorry if it's it's a little bit detail oriented or, or uh, techie sort of question, but I wanted to hear more 
because of the particular place of the ephemeral mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and of the serial in particular mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Black print culture, I wanted to hear more about how that model was going to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understood that you have the categories of work and addition and copy, and then you're trying to think, how do we deal with all these forms like magazines mm -hmm. and newspapers mm -hmm. and pamphlets that are so important to Black mm -hmm. print history, but don't fit in those book-based right, right. categories? And it sounds like you're trying to adapt that so that rather than work edition copy, it would be serial issue copy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm I'm thinking, wait, how deep are you going? Uh, because are you actually under, I guess it would be under issue, mm -hmm. intending to index? Mm -hmm. it's, it's about the relationship. Yeah. Laura, this, right. That yeah. piece I was quoting, it, it's not just about bibliographies, it's about bibliographies and catalogs and indexes. Mm -hmm. She's saying there are these different modes yeah, right. that we yeah. use to organize knowledge right so this is the place where a bibliography is kind of becoming yeah, an index yeah are you actually going to list the contents of every well, issue we're not going to list them we're going to link them which is to say that the poem is itself a work yeah and it is published in an issue right so every so let's say, poem or well, or we, we, you've got to decide how we're going to do this. We've got the problem. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll experiment with this in selective, you know, in, in, in particular runs of particular, um, you know, rich uh, journals. But you but you could theoretically, this is what we, we care to make it work, which is to say that the work is you, you have the work of the of the issue of the periodical and the issue. And then you have the work of the things that are in it. And what you need to is to link the poem to the issue of the periodical it appears in. But you're doing that for everything down at the level of individual poems or stories. all the literary works. All the literary works. We're going to have to make yeah. some yeah, this, hard well, calls. Because not every poem is the Negro speaks of written. No, that's, <laughs> that's true. That's <laughs> true. The poems in the tradition. Yeah. Um, but that, again, that raises this question of how do you actually pull that off and how deep do you go? Yeah. And then the user presumably there would be multiple points of entry. I could yeah. search by yeah. Hughes. I right. could search right. by title of this yep. poem. I could search by dedicated to James Weldon Johnson. Yes, you could. I yeah. could search. That's so you can find this looking from different angles. Right. Right. Am I yeah. understanding? Yeah, you can put any of the data points. So long as we've described the relationship. I mean, the computer is only as smart as you make it. Yeah. So so long as you've said uh, this book was dedicated to so and so, if that's a property that you enter, then that becomes searchable. Yeah. Um, and just to give you one one example of like one small query we were able to run with the eighty percent of the one hundred eight titles from the the slave the slave narratives that we entered into uh, uses our our prototype. Um, we did enter information about the dedications. Whenever there was a dedication printed yeah. in a book or handwritten, um, we would record it in the database. And there's a predominance of uh, defining a dedication to a collective body. This was, you know, this book is for the race. This book is for the people. And it was really striking. Total surprise. And, you know, in addition to this book is for, you know, I'm presenting this book to Meredith McGill. There are as many instances of the dedication being addressed to a collective body. Yeah. That was striking, you know, to be able to track how many, how many, how many black authored books have frontispiece portraits in them? Mm -hmm. We yeah. don't have an accurate run of those yeah. way of a, a census, so to say, of that. And that could tell us so much because I'm fascinated, for instance, that Phyllis Wheatley's, a, uh, not Phyllis Wheatley's, uh, Sojourner Truth's 1875 narrative has a frontispiece in, 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 in the front of the book, as you would expect, expect within a second image of herself in the middle of the book. Yeah. So what do you do with that example? So, um, but if we're describing the books with the kind of care that we hope um, to achieve, uh, you know, users can track that kind of information, right? Yeah. And I should say that there's been so much discovery 
at the table in special collections. Uh, it's not just, we're not just postponing discovery to the users of the database. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we were looking at um, some frontispieces pieces in slave narratives and realized that the, the um, illustrations were taken from photographs at the same studio in Boston. So what's up with that? Who was that person who ran that studio? Like, mm -hmm. I never would have looked at them if I wasn't, didn't have the job of describing them. I wouldn't have realized that it was the same, you know, I was sitting next to somebody's like, wait, you've got that, mm -hmm. that wh where are you putting that information in the data structure? And why do, why are all these uh, images of, of black authors being taken at the same daguerreotype studio? So anyway, it's been cool. Fascinating. One other big question, and then I'll open it up. <laughs> uh, the question of scope, you, you kind of touched on it, but I'm just, you can imagine what I'm gonna say. Uh, <laughs> I don't see how you get around it, and I don't see how you uh, delimit it, even at the inception, to a U.S. Anglophone focus. Yeah, yeah right. Um, if we're thinking about the history of Black bibliophile and bibliographic right. work, right. one of the really interesting things about that, mm -hmm. that people yeah. like Laura and Liz, Laura Helton and Elizabeth McHenry write about, is that because of what I was trying to describe, that they're trying to bring into view topics that have been invisibilized, that have been made hard to see. The breadth of the topic, the definition of the Negro as an object of study is in question, and they define it differently as they compile data. So some of them, Schomburg includes Hispanophone and Francophone materials. Dorothy Porter, I'm forgetting which one, but there's one where she says, I'm deliberately not going to deal with the Spanophone. Yeah. I know it's there, but that's yeah. not going in this list. Right. Right. Um, but the fact is, even if we're starting with Andrews and the slave narrative tradition, and we're dealing with people like Equiano, yeah. mm -hmm. people like Wheatley, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. people like Mary Prince. Right. So these are, are peoples of African descent, but who might've been enslaved in the Caribbean with Equiano, someone who's narrating his enslavement and a transatlantic voyage, with Wheatley, someone who's publishing in the UK. You can't just say this is a US yeah. Anglophone black field right from the start, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. where do you draw the line and how can you, it's both about where people are, where people pu are published, mm -hmm. and then the question mm -hmm. of language, yeah. Yeah. I just don't yeah. see how you, make that manageable yeah. <laughs> my my impulse is try to get it all yeah try yeah. to pitch it yeah. as big as you can mm -hmm. because to me the question is inherently mm -hmm. diasporic but mm -hmm. i'm just yeah. wondering you must have mm -hmm. this must be part of your agonized yeah. <laughs> conversations That's to you, Jack, you know? <laughs> i mean you've been thinking about this a lot and insisting on it from the beginning yeah i mean you know the other the other large scale question that ideally we ought to be thinking about from the start, you know, um, and what, what about black digital print culture? <laughs> you know, if we're gonna talk about contemporary black writing as part of the scene that we're trying to track, what about that too? So and that, yeah. that even amplifies the question of diaspora even more. Um, I mean, I think one way we've decided to deal with it is just you know, first of all, it's simple, but by the name of our project, Black Bibliography Project, to always have that as a as a provocation to ourselves about where are we beginning and how do we understand where we stand in the location of this project and how it must radiate out. Um, and I think in the initial sets of uh, the corpuses that we define have to push that definition at all it, yeah. in every turn. Um, that's that's what I would say at this point. Yeah. Um, and I think we have for ourselves though defined defined our work as US centric just because we're trying to imagine how far that scope would, would be. Yeah. Um, and we're committed to, and we've actually saved time in the project to really try to model out what, because uh, we don't want to take for granted, for instance, that the publishing formats across the Black diaspora are the same, Yeah. yeah. right? And so we, the, the very careful work that we have put into designing our data model 
and designing and defining the different categories that we think are important, right, to describing a black print material uh, object, that might need to change if we're talking about work that's made in the Caribbean or work that's made in the UK dep and depending on a period. So um, I think that it's, it. how do I want to say this, that if we, the name Black Bibliography Project always puts that question to yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And I would invite this, really, I, I meant it when I said this at the start mm -hmm. of our our time together that we need your questions, we need your feedback, we need your suggestions for where to begin. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and but what kind of, I guess the, the charge I would put to us with that is what what collective of texts will allow us to put pressure on the on the data models that we have to get to the, the scope of diaspora yeah. that we're describing. Right. right. So um so the risk is, I mean, the risk is that you don't you don't want to shut down avenues of inquiry. Yeah. Right. Right. And again, to me, it's baked into the tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the book of American Negro Poetry, right. 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 James Weldon Johnson, Placido is in mm -hmm. right. the yeah. book of American Negro Poetry. Right. Cuban poetry is not somewhere right. else. It's yeah. in yeah. that yeah. Right. of right. American right. Negro right. Poetry. Right. It's the proposition is that it's central to the definition of that field. Mm -hmm. um, Rene Marron, Kojo Tobu Marcus Garvey, they're in mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. They're yeah, in yeah. The crisis. Yeah. Right. There are a lot of translations right. from French and Spanish right. and other Portuguese, other languages. So you don't want your user to get to that stuff mm -hmm. and reach a dead end mm -hmm. and say, oh, Placido, that's not networked. Right. Yeah. Thanks and yeah. Hughes, I've got yeah. 14 yeah. different yeah. Kids, but yeah. Yeah. Placido, yeah. Right. nowhere to right. go. Right. You want to at least make it clear that there's a, an entire mm -hmm. entire world there yeah, right, that is yeah. a, an entire print world that James Weldon Johnson, right. that the book that you're getting it from, mm -hmm. is saying is crucial right. to the formation yeah, right. of American right. Negro. Right. You know that's the risk. You don't want to cut that no, that's exactly, in a way yeah. that violates right. actually what James Weldon well, Johnson, Johnson was right. conceiving, right? Yeah. Which is why perhaps one corpus of works could be anthologies across time, right? Yeah, but you're right. That question of, or maybe there's just some way of marking the limits. I mean, we're going to have to have limits, right, um, for the data be to be usable. Um, yeah. But 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 you can also mark those limits. You can be very clear. Uh, yeah. This is this is only a small tranche of you know of possible <laughs> uh, texts, right? Um, because yeah, it's it's tricky. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I I I dislike databases that don't advertise their limits because people then think they've done a comprehensive search. Yeah. When they've only found what's already been put in there and it's was partial to begin but with. That's, yeah, that's right. the mythology of the database. It's yeah. The notion right. of totality. Like yes. our right. students who say, wait, everything's on the internet. Yeah. Or nothing's <laughs> been written on X. And it's like, actually, it has been, but we don't subscribe to that database. You can't find it because, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, what I have more questions, but why don't we open it up? So I have a question. Go. Oh, I, 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 um, so this is this is just fabulous. There's there's no question about this. This is so exciting, um, and of course I'm going to ask the obvious question, which you have you know by heart, and a lot of a lot of obvious questions. Sorry. So this is you said this is only for um, literary texts, poetry. Well, not just poetry, but just we all literary. Have to make some call. On limits, on limits. Okay, so let's just say that I am Ivan Kalev, and I'm writing a, a new <clears throat> and I'm writing a new song, and I want to know um, where, if the, how many times and where the phrase "the heel of the dream" has appeared in. Black American poetry. Will I be able to do that? Not with our database. Not That's with your okay. Because we're not okay. doing outside text, like a lot of internet stuff. Yeah. Okay. They, 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 you know, that in fact, our first wave of digitization was just like getting print onto the net. Right. Uh, with yeah. 3DOCR back in the United mm -hmm. States, the mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. ways. Um, and we're not doing that. This isn't a Text this remediation okay project. okay but i will be able to get maybe 
titles that will have the word dream or the word heal in them. And then I, I might be able to get those linked together and, the, and those links will get me to more works that that will have that or no? Okay, all right, okay. It'll give you the, I mean, this is a limited project in that sense that it's really about um, uh, publication history. Okay. Um, but it, but you might discover that it was in a, that it was the title of the sermon uh, and you would learn that that sermon was given in Temple Hall in Boston okay. in 1842 okay. uh, and that speaker was introduced by, um, okay. oh, I don't know, uh, Frederick Douglass or whatever. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then you might also find that it was, uh, if we had this in the database, that it was, to a minor motion picture or right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so the so the biography the biography of each well, you find the names of the publication of the publication that's what i mean the biography of the publication it's fabulous oh yeah yeah so this i have tons of thoughts racing speed racing through my head but um I'm just going to stick to this because I, I, yes, I understood something better. There's the other question that immediately arises of your project as a model that then can be used in, in you know, in other archival fields within the Black tradition. I'm not even talking generally because I was thinking, um, you know, because we're talking about print, but you know, you're talking collective, uh, co community sort of production, collective work. Um, you know, there are pamphlets, broadsides, uh, typescript material that, you know, may ex exist in some collection and therefore it's traceable. There's others that are not and, and therefore they're gone, but they may not even have an author, there might be an author. And then I was thinking simultaneously because that, that the, 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 the Langston Hughes poem, the slide that shows your, would you say that was your dream? That's a dream. That is so intense. And, and of course I saw, you know, okay, and what, but jazz song, you know, this was per first performed. And I thought, um, you know, there's this guy who is, a, you know, like Brent says, then not, not a, an academic, um, but a kind lay historian, um, or lay bibliographer, John Corbett, who has done basically the, the entire history of a sunrise recordings, um, which are really in the thousands. Um, and, um, and then I thought, okay, now a, a, a model of this kind would give us extraordinary a capacity to cross, to see who was playing what, when, um, uh, some of this information is in fact are not known or lost, you know, et cetera, but, but might enable us to, to get an even better picture than we have now of what is in fact a collective project. And then that got me thinking of the fact that there, that in that archive, which is still being compiled, but you know, um, there are, there's a whole bunch of writings, the broad signed pamphlets, which are part of Chicago culture in 1950. I mean, they're part of a whole collective world. It's, just, it's not even beyond the, the fact that the orchestra itself is a collective world. I mean, I'm talking about Chicago. And so. so this is, this, this is what, but gets me incredibly excited, in addition to being excited about what you're doing, which is extraordinary, is that it, is, it can be a model for, for we, this is something that is a source that can lead into other people who would have other domains, we're all in the literary world, but, but you know, that could take this up. And, and, and because we're talking about a communal culture of such extraordinary magnitude <laughs> that is that interspersed through all of the arts and not and not just arts thought and that would be that's you know the great sort of black bibliography project uh, in you know in, in its vision yeah. oh, one of the reasons why um there's a reason why we're choosing to work in the wiki base domain um not simply because the Mellon Foundation wanted us to, but they wanted us to because they're funding other kinds of projects that are also trying to use that platform to figure out how to make collections, let's call it cross-walkable. Yeah. Right? Not siloed in not siloed, university yeah. databases. Right, right. And so 
when I hear you describe that kind of project, the scene of the scene of writing in Black Chicago is as varied as you're describing, yeah. right? Um, and it could very well be that the kinds of information that that comes out of what seems to be a discography that actually branches out into other media, like that could yeah. be its own project. It really could be. That ideally, the wiki-based environment could allow that project to learn lessons from how we're organizing our data and to be cross-walkable. It doesn't have to all be within one database, which is, I think, the exciting thing. Yeah. Which is why I'm not, I'm less guarded um, or defensive about the ways in which we're choosing to focus on literature in our database because there are other projects. So, you know, the, the idea of, of writings pluralities in the Black tradition, we have to respect that. And for Black studies, we have to think about that interdisciplinarity, um, but not simply for the feasibility of our project or the fact that as literary critics, that's the kind of habit of mind we bring to trying to define what, what are the objects of our inquiry. Um, but there are other initiatives that are creating databases that 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 are that are that are describing, say, black political science, black yeah. sociology, um, because there there are whole you know there are formats and discursive structures and practices in those domains that are particular to them, right? And we would want, I personally would want to respect that type of um, disciplinary practice, and the, the challenge would be. Could we, as we build up these databases, make them interoperable in some way? That, that's really the the idea of open data, linked open data, um, and a lot of Wikipedia is is trading on that. The, so we we have our own instance because we're trying to refine it, and we're really worried about quality control, concerned about not worried, but we have to think about the quality of the data before we make it public. But but Wikidata is precisely that kind of uh, linked data structure where we where data can be shared. So you could, when we put Francis Harper down as the author, uh, theoretically in our search uh, engine, information in Wikidata, if it's good, could be pulled pulled down along with the data that we have. The idea is that, that these uh, linked data projects would be open to each other. Uh, and one there's one great jazz project already in linked data form called Linked Jazz. It's run out of uh, Newark. And what they did, they, they had your same mind, uh, Stathi. They went through a whole bunch of oral histories uh, where people said, well, I gigged with so-and-so and then we were at this um, you know, Hall and so and so was playing sax and was backed up by so and so. Oh, yeah, somebody else was on drums that night. And so they've gone through and they've gone, they scraped all the names and they put all the names in linked data form. So then you can look at who was gigging with who. I mean, it's, it's a, it's just a, in the Newark Jazz Archives, they had a tranche of manuscripts that they, um, scraped for, for proper names and put into linked data form. And you can do these great little graphs. So just one question was that. Newark or was it Pratt Institute? The person running it is from Pratt, but the, but the, the data was taken out of Newark, uh, Rutgers Newark Jazz Collection. There was. Yes. Oral history, yeah. Um, 